Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this wake up talk. I'm going to guide you slowly through discoveries of archosaurs and dinosaurs in Switzerland from the past up to the present. And I show you a few highlights. If it works. You see, we're going to start with the very early discoveries. We're going to look at the low-lying 60s, the roaring 90s, then we look at the not any more surprising beginning of the new century, before we look at all the rest. Here you see a graph that shows you more or less the discoveries from 1856 up plus minus today that shows you all the localities have been discovered. So you see that in the very early beginning there was not much going on until the 90s and it started to go up and it doesn't stop. We have still plenty of sites to discover in Switzerland. There are plenty of time slices that haven't been looked at yet. But let's go to the very beginning. I'll show you a map. This is the principal uh, sites that we know. So you might know that most of these sites are confined to the Jura mountain chain, but there are a few uh, findings in high Alps here. We're going to look at those archosaur tracks, or also in the Swiss National Park or in the Pinsela. These are recent findings that I'm going to show you some spectacular photographs. So let's go to the sleeping 60s and I will present you also the revival of the 60s because we have been looking at those sites in the recent years to try to make a new interpretation. This is a historical piece from 1856. This is the first letter announcing that Amans Gressley, a geologist, had found st strange bones and this is the first drawing of the head of the tibia of Plateosaurus. This is the oldest finding. This is a letter I've been finding in our archives. And as you probably you can read this fluently. This is called Sutterling, so we had to translate it first. But it actually says, Dear Professor Rüttemeyer, while it's raining outside, I can do not, cannot do any field work, so I will write you because I have found some bones at the in the river, and this is the first piece. This is the type specimen of Gressiosaurus ingens. Nowadays, people think this is Platosaurus. The tibia head has a diameter of 30 centimeters. It's a very large specimen. I like the cover letter. It says Gressley, that's the, the guy. He wrote the letter on the 3rd of September in 1856, but look at this stamp, I love it. It says Basel, 3rd of September in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, that's really a precision. Nowadays, you will not get any letters in the afternoon. But this is the cover with a very old uh, stamp. This is in our collection, and Rüti Meyer was one of the first directors of the Natural History Museum in Basel. This is actually the very beginning. In 1961, two students of the ETH Zurich discovered a surface in the Swiss National Park. This is actually the surface, and they announced that they had found some footprints, probably dinosaurs. In 1992, there was a first short paper by Hans Fuller describing these tracks. Uh, belonging to probably platysaurids and theropods. This is high up, it's about 2,900 meters above sea level. And there's a second report in 2008. You can see a photograph uh, of these footprints from the Murderet member uh, assigning them to the Echnogenus pseudotetrasauropus, most probably the platysaur. And we, are, we have started now to do an overview and we are restarting all these specimens in situ because there is only a cast that exists in Zurich so it's not so easy to look at those so we have to climb up again. This actually, this red arrow triggered 
more or less our research in the area because a private collector uh, we had found a complete pterosaur in the early and the late Triassic and while looking for more bones he found very very enigmatic tracks. These tracks rounded about 25 centimeters. You can see clearly rounded here. This is a piss and up there is a manus. Uh, and you can see it's a bit off-road, I would say. This is a picture with a helicopter taken in September. It's not so easy to access, but it's in the late Triassic, it's in Orion, and it's an advanced sauropod. Actually, advanced sauropods should not occur at that time. And maybe two meters below, we have tracks of platysaurids. We did start actually uh, a campaign, which is not so easy because it, everything is steep there, and you can see all the different uh, days. We are continuously discovering new track sites here in the late Triassic. Some of them are more easily accessible, others are only accessible with my favorite toy. I call this the Swiss hammer, it's a helicopter. So you have to do prospecting in the morning. Okay, it costs, I know, but you can, if you get the money, you can fly around. I'll, I'll show you later on how nice that is. This is all discoveries from the last uh, 10 years. This is how it looks. Pizela is 3,339 meters high. On top is a site. It's really nice. It's the highest site here in Europe. It has a single footprint, or not several footprints, of a large theropod from the late Triassic. It's about 35 centimeters. That's where we work. You see Pizuglix, Gorondatini Zom. Or here. I particularly like Pitz Crap. <laughs> and there are sites on the pits, crap, you see. We have, our base is back down here, there's a small hut where we usually live and try to walk up these mountains. This is how it looks, these are the oldest surfaces we've been finding. It's in the middle part of the Hulk Dolomite group. There are trampled surfaces in, in many places. We don't know what kind of animal trampled these surfaces but they're very, very densely uh, trampled here. is a place in 3,000 meters, this is 3,200, and this is about 2,900. This surface is not accessible, it's too dangerous, you can only see it from the helicopter. But these are the first proofs in the middle part of the Hauptolomic group that we have some sort of large tetrapods walking around. Of course, not the steep part, it was flat ones, but you know that. That's how we work. This is a view from my office, from my field office. Uh, you can see my colleagues down here. And <clears throat> just a few meters below that, these sauropod footprints, we discovered things like that. 70 centimeters in size. Uh, it's not so easy to make pictures, as you can imagine. However, uh, I brought you here photogrammetric 3D models and, of course, here a 3D uh, footprint. You can see that we have clearly four digits that are curved and what is extremely interesting, we have a mammoth print up front. We think this is a platysaurid footprint with a mammoth. This is the only one we have here in the record. Uh, all the others show only pace prints. But Heinrich and I, we can, we can discuss this, if this is true or not. That this is the other part of the office. Uh, and here you can clearly see you have uh, three to four digits which are strongly curved. This is the usual uh, Psychotetos Europus footprint. It's about 70 to 80 centimeters in length. This is one of the surfaces here. We have several footprints here, all together also with the theropod footprints. And as you can imagine, it's not so, this is not for going to the toilet, this is just for cleaning. It's at 3,200 meters above sea level. 
Down below my colleague is about 1,000 meters of air. So don't fall. Uh, we have been trying to tie this into sequence stratigraphy, and it, is, it turns out that actually the tracks from the Trecimi di Lavaredo in Italy are probably the oldest teleport tracks we know. It, it's in the Norin, uh, Norin 1 sequence boundary. However, the tracks we have in Switzerland are most likely in the Norian 2 sequence. That means the prosauropod and theropod tracks from the Ela and Swiss National Park are most likely coeval with the Plateauzoic bone beds in the late Norian, what we know in Switzerland and also in southern Germany. So this is uh, more or less the same age. But let's go back to Heideland uh, because we're going to look at archosaur tracks here in the south western part of Switzerland. They have been studied for a long time. They started to be discovered in 1977 by a French geologist, Georges Brunner, and he believed these were archosaur tracks in 82. Georges Demartieu and uh, Mark Weidmann described them as dinosaur tracks, therefore they must be at least Ladinian in age. We successively doubted that these are dinosaur tracks, First we said these are just enigmatic tracks, and then we came to the conclusion these are mostly chiratinid tracks. And we have been looking at uh, this site and others uh, for the last few years. Uh, you can see a sort of a timetable. We have started in 2009 discovering more and more sites because we were just walking around. The geologists before us, they concentrated on one site, and we started, as you know, walking around the mountains, climbing, and we discovered successively about 20 new sites that form actually all in the same level. It's what we call a megatrack site that contains all these archosaur tracks. And now I show you why they were actually thought to be dinosaurs, because they just interpreted partially footprints of chiroteers and thought, for instance, this is a partial footprint of a chiroteer, but they interpreted it as a theropod. It is just an incomplete preservation because everything is here in sandstone. So they constructed all sorts of names. There are about 10 to 15 different igno species that have been erected at that time, but in fact, it's only chiroteroids. You can see we have a drawing from a most recent paper. Most of these tracks are very, very badly preserved, like the one here, for instance. But they are better preserved, and we know this is Chiroterium barti, or the allies, so we can actually tie that into the classical localities we know from Germany. This is how they look like. So, a, a person who is not really familiar with tracks would say, Oh, look, a sauropod. Oval, piss, and hourglass shaped uh, manuscript, but this is it's just a badly preserved chiratine in sandstone. The same holds true for these holes, which are all very badly preserved chiratine trackways. Work. Again, this is not so steep. We just have to hook up people so if they fall that the insurance will pay. Uh, but apart from that, we mapped here a large site, which is about 1,500 square meters in size. We also locked the whole sedimentology, so we know now how uh, the depositional environment was. It's a classical Bundsandstein facie in the Alps. So what we have found here is the southernmost part of the German uh, Germanic Bundsandstein basin in the Alps. And we know that it has a different age. This is photogrammetry of one of the sites. This is about 1,500 meters surface. This is a photographic model made by Peter Falkingham. This is traditional mapping on the, on the rope. So you can see the density of footprints here on this, on this thing. We have about 1,500 footprints on this surface. So this area was really heavily populated at the time. So this is actually the stratigraphy that uh, looks out. You see here the different igno genera. 
uh, by Demartier and Weidmann. They said it's Ladinian to Karn in an age. We think it's not. <laughs> it's just easy. If you look at them, we have three species, Caratinium barti, Caratinium sicroi, and Isocaratinium hercoli, which makes it a site that is a little bit older. We think we are here at the Oloniki and Nijin boundary, so we actually made the people, the local people, not very happy because they sell this site as dinosaur track site. Now they have to change all the brochures, it's just Arcosaur track site. So they don't like me up there, but it doesn't matter. So let's go to the roaring 90s. This was the first discovery in 19, what was it? 89. This is a, a quarry in the Jura Mountains. It is about 110 meters uh, high and about uh, 100 meters wide. Uh, I, at that time, was digging up fossil turtles and came up into that quarry on a Sunday morning and saw these stupid holes. I said, what the hell is this? These must be dinosaur tracks. The following day, I went to my institute and my two professors said, oh my god, Meyer, I think you have to go to the asylum. You're crazy. This is impossible because there's no dinosaur tracks in Switzerland. Now, one is still alive. He thinks, yes, I'm right. <laughs> it turned out to be one of the largest sites we have. It's an old quarry. And uh, successively, when you knew where to look in, in, in these sections, we were starting to find many, many more sites. And this was the first uh, late Jurassic megatrack site at that time. Uh, we were starting the first drone surveys last year, so we can remap the whole site. It has about 450 footprints with about nine trackways. Footprint size 1.2 meters, so very, very small animals. This is a site nearby uh, with a, a 3D surface photogrammetry by Matteo Belvedere. We have been finding small uh, footprints of sauropods, but also theropods. We will hear about this probably on Friday. There is the next site, a very large site. It also is about 2,000 footprints, about 2,500 square meters. And here again, footprint size 1.2 meters. Uh, this is a completely trampled surface. We have only a very few good individual footprints. We call this the Dino Disco. And you have Martin Lockley here for scale in his red tides. In between, we have found about 15 to 20 new sites. Most of them are more or less in the same level. Let's go to the not any more surprising beginning of the new century, which means about 2000. In 2000, there was actually something very special because Switzerland started to construct a new highway in the northern part in the Jura Mountains. And I was talking to the authorities and told them, hey, you're building a highway through late Jurassic sediments. Why don't you put up a paleontological survey? They said, are you crazy? I said, no, I'm not crazy, because this is your heritage. You're going to find lots and lots of fossils. Please give us some money. Now it's a, a huge project. It's called Paleontologie Arcees. And in the wake of these, there were, again, dinosaur footprints. This time, for me, a little bit boring, because it's flatline. It's, you cannot climb it. Uh, nevertheless, very interesting. This is one of the sites. This is not the original color. This is just colored for a 3D laser. Uh, we have here the first site. This is a picture by night, this is by day. Mainly sauropods, uh, theropods, and the like. This is Courte Or here, for instance, the Surcomprend track site with very large theropods, up to 80 centimeters in length. Probably the largest footprints we know. Different small a tridactyl dinosaurs, baby sauropods. Uh, Matteo will tell us about the baby sauropods from this site later on. 
Another site, 4,300 square meters with two excavated levels, 6,800 tracks, 64 sorpo trackways, 153 tridactyl trackways, and trackways that go more than 100 meters. Some of those are turning around, so this is very, very spectacular, including also the very small tridactyls here. Uh, we don't know what this is, but these are very small theropods, not recorded anywhere else. Many sites, probably the most important database. Again, here, the site and aerial view with different thoropod trackways, very large thoropods, and also huge theropods. And here is a, a map of one of these trackways. Everything is documented, everything is measured, everything is in the database. It's probably the largest dinosaur track database that exists in the world. And it's really nice to work there. Now we know how it works. This is a secret strategic scheme of the late Jurassic, and it shows you all the different levels where we find tracks. So we have from the Oxfordian here up to the variation, we have different levels where we find dinosaur tracks, maybe at a second or third order sequence boundaries. And you can see we don't have or we have dinosaur tracks, we have bones, we have plants, we have indications of fresh water. So the late Jurassic of Switzerland has turned into a shallow water emergent platform, and before it was deep water within 30 years. These are all the levels we have been detecting, and when you know the stratigraphy, you will find the sites. Despite the spinach that grows on the Jura Mountains, this is a bit the problem. It's too much forest on top and no outcrops. So let's go to the rest. This is a track site we have been stealing from France, don't tell them. It's just about five kilometers outside of the Swiss border. <laughs> it's in the early variation. It's not a very important track site despite of its age, but it's Still, in the variation, there is a few uh, dinosaur footprints in an old quarry, but they are the only dinosaur tracks in the Cretaceous of the Jura Mountains. Don't tell Eric. <laughs> On another site, which is more to my liking, this is the early Cretaceous. And the funny thing is that uh, one of our tectonic students, he used to climb there. And after climbing, he was refreshed and taking a bath in the Lake of Lucerne. And he said, what? What's up there, these strange things? And he got up again and came up with photographs of iguanodontid footprints in the early Cretaceous. Again, a formation, the Schrattenkamp formation, that's supposed to be deep water. I'll leave it up to you if the iguanodontids had very long legs or if this was shallow water. But it's nice to work there, have a nice view. These are the footprints, iguanodontids. There are three trackways, one of them has also manus prints. This is the latest discovery, it is very interesting, with Dani Marti. Uh, these are sauropod footprints and theropod footprints in the Oxfordian. These are the oldest ones in the Swiss Jura Mountains, uh, indented in freshwater stromatolites that are full of kerosene. So we have fresh water on the Jura platform. And the interesting thing is that in the early 60s, this peculiar site was interpreted as a tidal channel. So sometimes tidal channel change their faces and turn into sauropod footprints. Including here, the small tridactyl. So, to sum it up, in the last years, Switzerland has become one of the most important uh, countries to study late, dinosaur, late Jurassic dinosaur tracks, and I think it yields the largest and best documented data set of this period anywhere in the world what concerned tracks. Thousands, as we estimate, that 15,000 tracks have been found in the last 20 years. Upcoming, we are working at something that, might, that the market might be interested. We are working on a new interpretation of the late Triassic bone beds of Frick, which I will be present next year, and you will be surprised. <laughs>
However, the present starts for me in two weeks, and I'll show you something if it works. That's my office. See? That's the sites we are working in the, in the, in the Griso, in Sweden. And you see all these surfaces, they wait to be discovered. Yeah. See? This is a very nice section. Here we have dinosaur traps, like in here, we have them here. This is the morning, let's say, the morning commute. Uh, after 8 o'clock, the helicopter comes and picks us up. And then we have, first we have a nice view. <coughs> this is all uh, dolomite, principal dolomite here, nicely bedded. Then we fly over here. And I'll show you soon uh, our office. This is the dol principal dolomite and the, the, the grayish, the darker layer up there is the Kesson formation. Where there are also dinosaur tracks. Uh oh. <laughs> That's probably the breakfast that hasn't stayed. <laughs> See? It's nice when it's nice weather, but when it's bad weather, it's like, you see, it is easily folded here. These are the surfaces, the upcoming nice surfaces we're going to look at here. Our surfaces. The problem with, this, with these sites is that usually they are covered in snow and you never know if the snow is gone. Very nice. We're going to look at these surfaces. This is the office up here. This is Pizzli Gel at 3,127 meters. And now it starts again. So this is a view of my office. And I would like to thank all my collaborators for the past 30 years, Tony Marti, Henry Klein, Matteo Novella, Mike, and all the others. This is one of my students. Uh, she's being tested if she can really work uh, in the mountains. That's what you have to do. And with that, I thank you for your attention.